Welcome everyone. Today we will be discussing a very well known poem to his coy mistress written by Andrew Marvel. This poem is very famous as a monumental memorandum of metaphysical poetry and so it is prescribed in the syllabi of almost all of the universities where English literature is taught. So Without further ado, let us first focus on the title of the poem and observe what it can convey to us. The title of the poem is not just to his mistress or to his beloved or anything like that. Instead, it has an adjective included in it, coy. Why was it necessary for this adjective to be included in the very title of the poem. It was necessary to point it out that the poem was not primarily focused on the mistress or love or courtship. Rather, the subject matter is concentrated around the coyness of the lady and how to respond to such coyness in courtship or love. The poem is divided into three stanzas, structurally composed with a syllogistic style of diction. What is a syllogism? A syllogism is a method of logical argument in which one conclusion is drawn out from two premises. As it is already told, the poem does neither focus on the mistress nor on the announcement, declaration or explanation of the lover's love to his mistress. No, Andrew Marvel has consciously eschewed those two cliched subject matters. We know from our expected knowledge of the Elizabethan sonnets that exaggerating the beauty of the beloved with hyperbolic expressions and wooing with the help of extravagant figures of speeches were very common and perhaps thought to be the only natural style of poems concerning love. Marvel has consciously deviated from those ideas. And in his way to deviate towards a logical approach rather than exponential exaggerations of extravagant expressions, he actually denigrated those previously predominant ideas regarding the style of diction in poems of love. Marvel has focused on the significance of time in our life and presented an expression of courtship in which the topic of physical union is not shunned in the name of ideal gentleness but to be discussed with utter seriousness in compliance with the characteristics of the real world. In short, Marvel is a proponent of practical approach in love rather than an ideal one. Marvel teaches us through this poem that the limitations of time and space holds serious significance in our life and so courtship cannot be a never-ending process in the name of virtuous coyness and purity. So, the lover's approach should be practical, logical and realistic and the lady's response should also not to be clouded by coyness. Coyness was seen, even today it is seen so in a major part of the world, as an emblem of virtuousness in a woman. The idea was, and maybe it still is in all conservative societies, that a virtuous woman will not easily succumb to the wooing of a lover. It was considered that the more virtuous a woman was, the more coyness she would show to the advancement of the lover. The poet is striking upon that very idea of virtuousness. The concept of platonic love 
stressed on the idea of loving without any physical intimacy, physical outcome or physical fruitfulness. So, platonic love means to be affectionate and admire the lady whom you love endlessly without having the pleasure of love being reciprocated in the same way, without even dreaming of love in return or desiring to get any physical pleasure in love. This never-ending, futile pining for a single person with utmost dedication without the tiniest gain in return was considered to be the ideal love in Platonic ideology. Desiring anything more than that was not only considered as not being true love, but also considered to be vulgar. The idea of platonic love was famously propagated by Francesco Petrarca, commonly known as Petrarch, the Italian Renaissance humanist, through his sonnets. In England, Edmund Spencer deviated from not only the Petrarchan rhyme scheme in sonnets, but also his Amoretti speaks of a successful love affair, not of an unrequited one. Still, although Spencer and Shakespeare both have deviated from the idea of unrequited and non-physical love, even the best of the deviations from Platonic love in Elizabethan poetry talk about, the, talk about either the beauty of the beloved or the idealization, realization, eternization of their feeling of love. The essential pragmatism was missing in the approach and what was left in the name of speaking of love was nothing but either a rant of irrationally expressed exaggerations or poorly restrained emotional outbursts. The metaphysical poets put an end to this hypocrisy of sweet hyperbolic sounds and stressed on a logical, argumentative, pragmatic, physical as well as spiritual kind of love in their poetry. When John Donne said, what I desired and got regarding his wife in the poem The Good Morrow, he did not only declare his satisfaction in his affair of love, but also slammed hard on the social conservatism and poetic ideology that were against the use of such bold words about holy relationships. Dunn even did not stop after using the word desire, but he vehemently claimed that he had got what he had desired. Clearly, this line was to be considered as a vulgar expression of unholy love from the perspective of the proponents of platonic love. But this is precisely how the metaphysical poets chose to strike on the unrealistic approaches towards a real world feeling called love. Now we shall focus on the poem itself. In the first stanza, the lover says to the lady whom he is pursuing to woo, that he would wait eternally for her acceptance of him if he had enough time. And if he had enough space along with time, he would show no hurry in getting an answer from her and would let her go on searching for rubies near the Indian Ganges side. He would be creating the monument of ideal love by being so patient about it that it would grow at a speed with which vegetables grow. And due to its ideal quality, it would be vaster than empires in a relative significance based on time and space. This earthly life restrains us with so many limitations that we cannot simply do what would have been the ideal thing to do otherwise. So, Marvel is actually mercilessly mocking the ideal process of courtship 
by exaggerating that if the lover had infinite time in his hand in this earthly world to wait for the love to be reciprocated, surely he would do it. The mockery is in Marvel's exaggeration of the points regarding what could the lover do in that ideal state of being and to what degree he would do it. The extreme expressions of special distance physically and perpetual patience mentally are quickly followed by the exaggerated expressions of appreciating the beauty of the beloved. Marvel mocks the common poetic notions of praising strenuously the beloved's beauty by mentioning that in an ideal situation where life would have no limitations of time, the lover would certainly appreciate the beauty of the beloved by appreciating each of the parts of her body for centuries or millenniums. He would not only admire the forehead for a hundred years, but also would spend 200 years after that to adore each breast. Now, this 200 years to adore each breast is a bold expression, but it is almost nothing compared to the boldness of the whole poem. The question is, why does Marvel say that? Actually, Marvel is mocking the way in which poets praise a woman. And society pretends as if that is the flawless expression of appreciation of the beauty of the beloved. They praise the beauty of a woman as if it is the only thing that matters in love. And yet they praise some of the body parts like the eyes or the cheeks which are traditionally considered to be gentle to look at and appreciate and they deliberately avoid mentioning other parts as if those parts were never looked at or were never worthy of mentioning. Seriously, all you can observe, talk and appreciate about a lady is her virtuousness and beauty and nothing else. And even after that, you forget some aspects of the body just to pretend to be formal or gentle. Andrew Marvel is striking precisely upon that kind of hypocrisy by writing these bold lines. According to him, if the lover has to admire a lady for her beauty, he should admire her body from top to bottom, from the gentle forehead to the erotic breasts, putting significance everywhere, skipping no chapter of the book. There is no hypocrisy in Marvel's style of expression. He just doesn't pretend to be formal or gentle to an irrationally unnatural degree. We should also focus on the word enough before time. We understand from our reading of the first stanza that by saying enough, Marvel is actually meaning unlimited or infinite. Then why doesn't he say that? Why does he use the word enough instead? We shall understand that very soon, but before that, we shall conclude our understanding of the first stanza by focusing on how Marvel has mocked the concept of ideal love. It is the philosophical belief of any idealist that anything that is ideal is greater than anything that is material. Marvel doesn't deny that. He just says that the lover could follow the ideal process of love if he had enough time. Marvel is not questioning the ideal for being what it is. He is just questioning its applicability in the real world. The course of ideal love and courtship was ideal to be followed in an ideal world where it can be followed perpetually. This is the statement Marvel has propounded in the first stanza, which is the first premise in the syllogistic structure of this poem. The second stanza begins with a but. 
as a sudden halt to the exalted expressions of the first stanza. With this simple single word, Marvel has struck down the high-flown imaginations of the ideal course of love to ground reality. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. Now we should understand why Marvel used the word enough instead of anything else. The word but is stressed to deny what we were wishing to have in the first stanza. If we had expected infinite time in the first stanza, the impact of this but in the second stanza would have been simply not having infinite time, implying that maybe we have enough time, just not infinite. But Marvel used enough time as our object of wish in the first stanza. And so, in the second stanza, the impact of that but is much stronger. But we don't have enough time. So, now Marvel is stressing on the scarcity of time instead of focusing on its finiteness. To make this point clear to the beloved, the lover narrator says that his love song, which is being neglected by her today, will not disturb her when her lifeless body will reside peacefully inside the grave. Apparently, this sentimental tone does not continue to remain sentimental throughout the statement. Rather, it strikes the beloved down to an unprecedented vulnerability by presenting a vividly horrifying image of the grave. This is another example of how bold metaphysical poetry can be in its practice of logical argumentativeness. In the first part of the statement, the lover tells that the grave is a place where she will not be disturbed by his echoing love song. Then without any delay, he says that there in the grave, her long preserved virginity will be eaten away by worms without any regard for how virtuous she was in her earthly life. All the honor that she is preserving today in the name of purity will be turned into dust. The word lust is to be noted here. Why? Why is Marvel not calling it love instead of lust? Because talking of physical desire in the subject of love was considered vulgar in those days, as I have mentioned earlier. It was said that love or any kind of holy bond must be deprived of unholy desires such as sex. Whenever the unholy desire of sex was expressed, explicitly or implicitly, the bond was to be considered as unholy as lust. So, when Marvel is talking of physical enjoyment in love, it is quite natural that the reader as well as society will consider his words as words of lust instead of love. The beloved may react similarly to the lover who talks about sex so straightforwardly and may call it as his lust. So, Marvel as well as his lover narrator concedes that word, but instead of denying it, accepts it wholeheartedly. So for Marvel, whether you call it lust or love, it does not matter. As long as it happens realistically in a real world, equally enjoyable to both of the couple. By conceding this point of lust, Marvel is actually avoiding the endless argument of love versus lust because it has no point. There is no empirical method that can prove and define love. And Marvel doesn't care to use meaningless expressions to explain the magnitude or truthfulness of that abstract feeling. Love cannot be proved through logical arguments. But the approach towards love 
can be logical and marvel is concerned with the latter no matter whether you think his feeling is genuine or not as long as it is logical whatever you call it marvel is happy with that the second stanza ends with an emotionally weakening statement that going to the grave after living a chaste life as a virgin is great but once you are there you will remain there all alone and no one can embrace you even if you crave for it then the third stanza is the final conclusion deduced from the two premises presented in the two preceding stanzas the first premise stated how ideal the course of courtship could be if we had enough time and space the second premise declared that every moment of life is a part of the decaying process which ultimately ends in death so the final stanza concludes that we should use the remaining time of our life as efficiently and as practically as possible without wasting it behind our coyness and lofty unrealistic ideologies in making his concluding statement marvel uses many images youthfulness is compared to morning dew which has a very short term of existence without coyness the course of love should resemble the attitude of amorous birds of prey as it will fiercely break through all the social conventions regarding gentleness in love marvel is denying the concept of gentleness in love that is created by human society and religion and instead he is propagating the supposedly ferocious style of the hunting birds which is nothing to be ashamed of if reviewed from the natural perspective marvel goes further to depict an image of physical union between the couple and he also alludes to a certain philosophical idea in which the body is compared to a castle in which life resides in the last couple of lines marvel has summarized his idea with a simple but bold image the couple should be using their remaining time on earth so efficiently in enjoying the course of love that even sun who represents time will become jealous of their enjoyments the sun will be so scared to see them not being scared of the coming of death at the end that he himself will try to run faster to outrun the lovers in a race of life versus time i hope this discussion will be helpful to you in some way or the other if you like it please share it thank you